Thank you all for being here on time, and uh, welcome to day two of the Future of California Elections 2016 Annual Conference. We're very delighted to have you all back here for our second day of uh, the conference. We want to start, of course, by thanking the James Irvine Foundation for their generous support uh, of this conference. They are the sponsors, as well as their continual funding of FOS. Thank you, Annalise. <laughs> uh, we also uh, extend our thanks to uh, Community Partners, the corporate home of future California elections, to the California Endowment uh, for providing us the use of this uh, beautiful facility. We want to thank uh, our conference volunteers uh, who have done a fantastic job. Let's give a round of applause for the volunteers. Uh, as some of you will recall, uh, and there are on many of the tables, but certainly out in the lobby, there are white signs that read, the future of California elections is. And then there's a big blank space, and that blank space is there for your creativity. So take a marker and make a uh, personal uh, statement by completing that sentence, and then have somebody take a photo of that you holding that sign, and uh, put that on Instagram with the hashtag FOS2016, F-O-C-E-2016. FOS2016 is the hashtag on Instagram. And if you do that, it's going to show up on this photo scroll on the bottom of the screen, but it'll also be making an important part, an important contribution to our online social media conversation that's running uh, con congruous with this, with this conference. If you tweet with the hashtag FOS2016, that also is an important way to participate, and it will show up in the top part of this uh, scroll. Hey, there I am. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I hope my mom is watching. So, but this is, uh, this is a part of the, of, the, of the ongoing conversation that we're having here, and we hope you join it. Last announcement before we launch into this morning's business is, uh, as I said yesterday, we really take seriously the issue of feedback, uh, the conference evaluation form. You received one in your program booklet. There are also some extras scattered around the room on some of the tables, and there are some out at the uh, check-in desk. So please know that we take your conference feedback very seriously. We welcome all the compliments, kudos, tips, and praise. Um, but more importantly, we welcome the constructive criticism and suggestions as to how we can run this better next year, how we can make this a better conference uh, for you. Um, so with that, we're going to uh, begin the, uh, the discussion today, and it's my privilege to introduce uh, the chairman of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. I have to make a correction to the program book, which identifies Commissioner Hicks as the vice chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. But as of yesterday, as of yesterday, he is in fact the chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, and so you can make that, uh, that correction in your, in your program books. Uh, this is his first public appearance anywhere in the country uh, since taking on this important role. <laughs> so this was all by design, believe me. So uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Hicks was nominated uh, to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission with the unanimous consent of the uh, United States Senate. Um, I'm sure we'll see unanimous consent from the Senate on even more nominees this year, but I'll let Commissioner Hicks <laughs> speak to that. He served, uh, prior to that, he served as the Senior Elections Council and Minority Elections Council for the U.S. House of Representatives uh, Committee on uh, House Administration. So he truly is one of the foremost experts on election law, process, procedure in the United States. Um, prior to that, uh, he uh, had worked with Common Cause. He served in the Clinton administration. Uh, he's a very, very distinguished guest, and we're very honored to have him here today. So please join me in welcoming Commissioner Thomas Hicks. Thank you. Thank you so much for those interesting words. I always say, who, who is this guy? And, um, and my mom still does not know what I do for a living. Um, so I want to... Um, do this a little bit differently than I have the PowerPoint here, because I think that a lot of you already know a lot about the Election Assistance Commission. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes and then um, talk a little bit about what I want to see happen 
um, and some of my own internal thoughts that the keynote speaker gets to uh, gets to raise as um, per my per, per, per my privilege of being keynote, um, and then uh, answer any questions that you may have that are not stump the chump questions. Um, so. Um, the Election Assistance Commission, established under HAVA in um, October 29, 2002, signed by President Bush, um, and the first commissioners were sworn in in 2003. Um, it opens its doors in 2004. There are two commissioners from the Republican Party and one commissioner from the uh, Democratic Party, myself. Uh, there's one vacancy that still is uh, on the commission. Um, I've gone to the White House several times and said that I really do like my fellow commissioners, but I am a, just a little bit lonely, and hopefully uh, that will be done sometime this year. Um, as was said, I am now chairman of the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, Matt Masterson is serving as vice chair, and former chairwoman Kristen McCormick uh, is still on the commission, as a, um, but she is now uh, commissioner as well, is still commissioner as well. Um, the Help America Vote Act was signed by Congress um, to address several fundamental things that needed to go on after the 2000 election um, to meet new standards, replace voting equipment, um, aging voting equipment, and improve election administration as overall. Um, it created several mandates with minimum standards for states to follow. Um, and um, one of those mandates that I am very happy about in, in terms of my time with uh, Common Cause was provisional voting, um, um, voting information being passed out, uh, updating voting equipment, statewide registration databases, um, voter ID procedures, and administrative complaint procedures. The EAC and HAVA, um, HAVA established EAC to distribute money. We distributed $3.2 billion to the states. Um, I know one of the questions may be where is additional funding going to be coming from, and um, I don't see any additional funding coming from Congress anytime soon. Um, my hope is that with a new president um, from either party that uh, folks will, will be able to talk to those that, that individual about adding additional funding to um, to HAVA in, in forms of um, ensuring that elections continue to run smoothly. Um, the AC was to create the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the Testing and Certification Program, uh, and the Development Guidelines to meet HAVA requirements. Um, maintain the National Voter Registration Form, which I'm sure I'll get questions about a little bit later as well. Um, and administer at the National Clearinghouse. And we are in the process now of updating our website, which we think will serve more as the function of getting information out in terms of our National um, Clearinghouse function. We have three boards, um, a standards board, which is 110 members, which has um, two members from every jurisdiction in the United States in terms of every state and territory. Um, it's 55 state election officials and 55 local election officials, and they can't be from the same party. Um, the Board of Advisors, which is a 37-member board, which has key stakeholders and organizations, and which I serve as the designated federal officer. Uh, we will be having our next meeting in Chicago uh, the first week in May. Um, and the Technical Guidelines Development Committee, uh, which deals with the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines. Um, we just recently had our meeting in D.C. in the beginning part of February, and um, Matt Masterson serves as the DFO for that. Since taking office at the EAC, we have, and this is just my, my map here, so during last year, I went to 20 different states, and I flew all over the country talking to individuals, voters, state and local election officials um, about voting experiences, how the EAC can be there to help, and um, basically try to move the ball forward in terms of the agency had been stagnant for over four years. And I think that uh, overall, the three commissioners and myself went to over 30 states, um, and I'm assuming that this will be even more travel this year with it being election year and be serving as chair. Um, that being said, I think that elections, and, and, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to um, come here today, is because I think that this is a truly amazing group in terms of election officials, in terms of advocacy groups, students, and other individuals coming together 
to um, talk about elections. Um, one of my pieces of my background is when I worked at Common Cause, I uh, was a lobbyist and policy analyst and, and actually lobbied on HAVA, or uh, as we like to say, educated on HAVA, because I guess lobbying is a bad word, basically. So we educated on HAVA and uh, what, what became HAVA, and that was the first time that um, election officials civil rights groups and organizations and members of Congress had come together to vote on a civil rights legislation that quickly. So HAVA was basically started in 2001, um, and then it was basically signed less than 18 months later on October 29, 2002, uh, by a Republican president, and it had overwhelmingly bipartisan support. More than 400 members of Congress voted for it, and um, I think 90 five or 96 members of the Senate voted for it. So it was overwhelmingly supported. So at the end of April, we are going to have a disability access hearing um, at Suffolk Law School. And one of the things that I want to make sure happens is that we continually talk about and work on disability access. Um, that is one of the fundamental things that, that goes on with HAVA. Three of our six mandates in HAVA to, to distinctly talk about disability and disability access. So um, we don't know the exact time yet, but we are talking to our, my fellow commissioners, um, and we have locked down the date of the 27th and the location of Suffolk Law School. So the other thing that we're doing um, for 2016 is, and I'm, I'm not that old, but I'm not that media savvy. Um, as well, but I'm trying to learn more and more as things go on, as time goes on. So we have this hashtag, I think I'm saying it right, hashtag be ready 16 in terms of things that we're going to be doing um, at the EAC and getting information out to the state. So in terms of that be ready 16, um, we will be talking about contingency planning, vote by mail issues with the United States Postal Service, accessibility, poll worker recruitment and training, voting systems, procuring new um, election technology, maintaining those systems, and integrating those systems as well. And this is a snapshot of our website, um, so I encourage you all to go to it uh, to look in terms of things that we will be doing in terms of contingency planning and um, being ready for 2016 uh, overall. And so if there are other things that we should be doing and should be working on, feel free to contact us so we can evaluate that and see if that's something else we can um, start to look into. So contingency planning. So in January, we had a roundtable discussion, which is also available on our website, um, where we called in state and local election officials and other individuals to talk about um, how they dealt with battleground situations. So we brought in large states, small states, blue states, red states, purple states. Um, all these folks in to talk about um, how they dealt with certain issues that occurred during elections um, and, and how they can get more information out to other um, individuals and states themselves. So uh, the other thing that we have on our website is six tips for contingency and disaster planning. We have a video on contingency planning, um, the clearinghouse function that we're working on, and we have a quick start guide as well. Um, poll worker resources. So I'm very happy to say that hopefully by the end of next month, um, April or beginning of May, we will be releasing our um, poll worker recruitment guide, um, updating it from 2007. So it's been a long time in the works, and we are hoping to um, have that released relatively soon to help uh, states and localities look towards recruiting college poll workers and other poll workers as well. One of the things that I am looking forward to is doing a webisode um, at, uh, on this issue um, towards the end of next month as well, and hopefully that will be up by the beginning of May or the beginning of June um, on talking about um, how states can go about and how other individuals can work towards being poll workers as well. Um, this is a snapshot of the former poll worker guides that we had in 2007, and we hope to have those updated, like I said, relatively soon, and those six tips for employing effective poll workers as well, which are all available on our website. Testing and certification. So 47 out of 50 states use some aspects of the testing and certification program with 
the, um, with um, the EAC. Uh, on average, it takes about six to eight months to certify a full voting system and 12 days to a month for modifications to that system. Um, I'm going to skip over that one. So innovation is still happening um, with ballot delivery systems, commercial off the self uh, based systems, online voter registration, which I feel will be a huge um, issue for us to deal with in the relatively future. So I see that I have about five minutes left. So I'm going to skip over some of these things and talk about um, a couple of things that I think, well, um, also on our website is 10 things about selecting a voting system and 10 things about managing a um, aging voting system. Um, our state certification will be happening in, 20, um, in June 20th in 2016 in Cambridge. And additional topics, which I don't think I'll be able to deal with as quickly as possible. So um, of this, I think the most important thing here is I want to start talking about um, poll workers being able to serve basically on a half day situation in terms of I think that we would be able to recruit more poll workers if they weren't able to um, be um, tied into having a full 12 hour day, but if they can do two hours or four hours or six hours, we might be able to get more poll workers into the, um, into the pipeline. So um, what can you do? I think that all of you here um, should do your best to um, ensure that elections are running smoothly. I think that you know by you coming together and you talking to one another, I think that one of the best things to, that, that occurs in elections is when people actually talk together and so that they can uh, work towards um, a common goal. Um, I'm the only Democrat on the commission right now, but I think that my two fellow commissioners and I, and I know that this is true, um, agree on 95% of things that go on. But the one thing that we already have agreed on is that no matter what things we do battle on, that we will come back at the end of the day and still be able to talk. Because I think the EAC at one point um, didn't have this sort of function. And I'm going to ensure as chairman that we do not go back to those days. So, and um, one of the things I always say is dance like, um, and I know this is not my saying, but is dance like no one's watching. Um, and basically, when I was uh, coming here yesterday, um, I added this part, dance like no one's watching, but also treat others as if everyone is watching. So that, you know, you don't basically, you know, you know, we're all adults, you know, so basically, you know, as poll workers, as election officials, you know, there's no need to basically try to step on someone else's ideas or, or the way that they want to live their lives. So, you know, dance like no one's watching, but, you know, treat people like everyone else is watching. Um, last night, I was having dinner with some folks and having a few, what we like to say, cocktails. And um, we talked about Obama being elected. And it was one of those things that I said as an African-American male growing up in Boston, Massachusetts, that I would never see an African-American um, be elected to the presidency. And here we are seven years into his presidency. And um, I wanted to basically turn that into how can we get to online voter, online voting someday. You know, I don't think that I will see that in my lifetime, but we have to strive to make that happen. And so there's things that we can do like online voter registration to start that process. But we might not be able to get there tomorrow or 10 years from now, but we need to continually move towards that direction. So um, with that, I want to open up for questions. And sorry for talking so long. <laughs> or if you saw something on the slides that I had, you know, breezed over that you wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, go right ahead. So right here. Concern about um, online voting is there's no ballot. 
There's nothing to count. It's not, it, so we don't have an election. So I'm among the many people that would never, ever want that for our democratic election. Okay. Well, I would say that just like online voter registration, um, that it would be an additional tool, that it wouldn't be the only thing that you would have. And I'm not saying that we should do that tomorrow, but I'm saying that we should move forward with it at some point so that these things are already happening in terms of electronic ballot return. So I'm thinking that we need to work towards ensuring that, you know, 10 or 15 years down the road, we're not still having the same sort of discussions about, well, why can't we do this? I think that it was very interesting um, to listen to, to read about Apple, um, talking about the, in the, the controversy that they're having with, their, with the iPhone being being able to hack into it now, that I read something about they're working on a phone that's unhackable. And I think that we need to, we need to recruit these companies, these billion dollar companies that are huge and massive that do all these different innovative things to start working on elections and bring them in to do these sorts of things. So why can't they work towards ensuring that military and overseas voters can send their ballots back because they don't have the opportunity to go into a physical polling place. But I think that we need to at least just start the discussion is more of it than anything else. <laughs> so I guess there was a couple over here. Hi there, Nate Kaplan with C Political. I'm also from Boston, and my question is, uh, are you as disappointed as I was that the Patriots didn't make it into the Super Bowl? I am uh, hoping I am hoping that Matt Masterson is watching this, because he's a big Cincinnati Bengal fan, and I always say that my Pats are much better than. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Dean. We know he's a Seattle fan. <laughs> Go Pats. Fan. Go Pats. Uh, I actually do have a real question. Um, in, in your experience, do you ever think we'll ever be in a situation where there is one uniform guideline that comes from the feds as far as how elections are administered rather than trickling it down to state and county city levels? I think that because of the way the Constitution is written, that states will be the ones that actually administer elections. So what happened, what, what runs well in New Hampshire will not necessarily work in California. So I don't think that there's a one size fits all um, approach that should be taken for elections in general. But that being said, when we worked on HAVA, we said that there, there should be a carrot and stick approach in terms of there should be certain mandates that are basic things that go on and basic standards. And so I think that with any sort of thing, there should be some sort of basic floor that states can adhere to. They might be able to branch out from that and add things to it, but there should be some sort of basic floor. You had your hand up. Mm -hmm. All right, the suggestion for poll workers serving half a day, mm -hmm. was that based on survey or? That's just my thoughts, though, oh. just my topics. So I think that I think they would be great in terms of getting basically um, more students involved, um, more um, folks who might not have 12 hours to devote on a Tuesday. Um, or if you do early voting, you can have more folks um, basically being able to um, do these sorts of things. But I think that this is something that I think states should be looking at in terms of poll worker recruitment itself. I don't know if I should have Whitney or Doug ask any questions. I'm a little worried about that. So go ahead. So Tom, I've watched the EAC taking some real leadership on um, accessible voting this year, and I just wanted to throw you an open question because you didn't talk about it much to talk about what your thoughts about what the most immediate needs are and what the long-term um, moves are for that. I think that um, immediately we need to continually talk about um, disab disabled voting. Um, I think that we are working with um, several groups. Uh, one of the things that I want to do is um, have a voter guide for uh, disabled voters to let them know what their rights are when they go to a poll. Um, not necessarily looking at um, what's wrong with the polls, but more of these are your options and these are your rights, just like everyone else. Um, but I think that my fellow commissioners and I have come together after we had our first disability hearing in um, D.C. back in July to say we need to hear more 
about what's going on. So uh, we came together, and uh, we're going to have this ne this next hearing in Boston, and it will be webcast. So if uh, folks um, want to look at our website and be able to um, be able to uh, see what's going on, um, that would be helpful. And I, also, if you can get to Boston, uh, home of the New England Patriots. Um, <laughs> Um, but at that time, it will be the Red Sox playing. So, um, so um, feel free to come because it will be open. Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you blew past it really quickly, but do you want to summarize really briefly how um, certification and the standards is changing and how folks in this room can get involved in that process? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love softball questions. Um, the way that the process worked before was that NIST and the EAC would um, develop requirements, presentation to the Technical Guidelines Development Committee, revisions based on that, presentation to the TDGC, approved by the TDGC, public comment period, revisions based on comments, presentations to the EAC commissioners, and then approval and implementation. This took forever to get accomplished. And so what we have come together to say should happen, is that constituency groups and public working groups should join um, on our, um, it's NIST dot, I think it's, let me make sure that I have it right. So it's voting at NIST.gov, um, that if you go to that, you can join these public working groups on um, helping reform the voluntary voting system guidelines. There's three groups that are involved in this, a pre-election working group, a election working group and a post-election working group, and we're hoping that when we write these guide, when the TDGC writes these guidelines during this next iteration, that we can avoid a lot of the, the pitfalls that occurred in the previous um, iterations that took forever to do. So I'm hoping that between 12 and 18 months, that we can have a new set of um, of guidelines. Um, and we've had two meetings, and I'm, uh, I'm not sure when the next meeting will be, but uh, folks can join those working groups and, and actually add input to this um, so that, you know, if you have a particular piece that you wanted to have functioning, that you need to actually join those groups and, and make those things happen. I know I'm sorry for having my back to you folks, so. But I love the stage of being able to walk. Good morning, Commissioner. My I'm sorry, this mic is loud. <laughs> um, I wanted to see if you can touch base about, um, will there be going to be a grant for language outreach under HAVA and also talk about um, the reinforcement of the Voting Rights Act on Section 203 and these languages? Well, we don't deal with the exact enforcement of 203. That's going to be going through DOJ. Uh, but we will deal with the administration piece. So going towards um, the language grants, I think that we are redoing our glossaries right now, and we offer these, um, offer all our guide, well, most, I'm not going to say all, because um, we don't, if we had additional funding, we would be able to do all, but we are offering our um, guides in seven different languages, um, and we are um, trying to get as much information out um, to as many different people as possible. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the, the article that was written on me, but I truly believe that we need to um, talk to additional folks about who, who necessarily don't speak English, but want to participate in the process. If you are eligible to vote, you should be able to participate in that right, regardless of the language that you speak. So, so I have one minute left, so I have, uh, I guess, one more question. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Kathy Zhang. I'm um, with the Sound of Hope Radio, which is the uh, nation's only Chinese language public radio station. And also, I um, was uh, newly appointed as the, one of the member of, for the Language Access Advisory Committee for the state of California. Yes. So, um, of course, my question would be related to the language access. So, just wondering what's the uh, effort from the commission uh, in terms of language access and how does that relate you know relates to uh, the lo more local state and local um, uh, work mm -hmm. related and my second question is uh, actually we were talking about 
uh, what the new immigrants, why, you know, how to encourage them to participate in the voting election. And uh, we talk about language, cultural um, barriers. And uh, one thing I was thinking about, have, you know, about the social and the political elements, because, for example, people from mainland China, they have never had experience with the democratic system. So in terms of that uh, education um, or related work, I don't know if ever, uh, the commission ever, you know, what's your thought on that? Thank you. I think that um, my, my personal thoughts is that we should involve more people into the process, regardless of the language that they speak. Um, if, they, if, if folks are eligible to, to vote, then they should be encouraged to do so. Um, we um, have translated our guides into seven different languages, and we offer that to all 50 states and all the, the five territories as well. Um, I think that there, there are other things that we could be doing. Um, we're in the process of trying to figure those things out, of um, how we can navigate the waters with that. Um, but I think that there will be you know, other additional things that we do. I don't know what, what exactly we can be doing. Um, but I think that encouraging more folks to, to participate um, is a great, great thing to do. Um, I think that um, it was proposed at one point that once people take the the uh, the oath of citizenship, uh, that they are also offered a voter registration uh, card as well. So that's one thing right there. Um, but we, you know, I think that that's something that um, I think Homeland has to has to get involved in as well. So, so, so I want to thank you all for having me here. Uh, this has been really fascinating, and I will be uh, here for the rest of the day. Uh, if there's any other questions that folks might want to want to ask, easy questions. All right. Thanks. <laughs>